This video tutorial is brought to you by TipSquirrel at www.tipsquirrel.com. For all kinds of Photoshop and Lightroom goodness, follow at TipSquirrel on Twitter or Facebook.com slash TipSquirrel. Hi everyone, Mike Hoffman here. A lot of people have been asking me lately about 3D and wanting to see more content related to Photoshop 3D. Now I wanted to take things a step further and I'm going to be bringing you a series of videos over the next several weeks delving into all the nooks and crannies of 3D in Photoshop CS6. However, in order to provide everyone with a common frame of reference and to make sure that we're all speaking the same language, I want to first begin with the basics. In this introductory tutorial, we're going to start with the fundamentals of 3D and the basics of using the 3D workspace within Photoshop CS6. Let's take a look. Photoshop's 3D capabilities are encapsulated in the 3D menu and in the 3D panel which is located under the window menu. You'll only see these panels and menus if you're using Photoshop CS6 Extended. For Creative Cloud members, your subscription includes the extended version, so make sure that you're running Photoshop Extended. Now to start out with, let's recall that basic Photoshop layers are a flat grid of pixels, and anything you place on them is in two dimensions. If you recall your high school algebra, we can consider the conventional objects to be on the XY plane, with the X axis going from left to right and the Y axis going vertically. With 3D, we add the third dimension, the Z-axis, which comes right out of the screen at us and it recedes into the screen in the other direction. Now working in 3D is tricky at first and it takes some getting used to, but Photoshop CS6 makes it very straightforward and in this latest version, the engineers at Adobe have done a lot of work to make the 3D tools function in a similar way to the rest of the tools in Photoshop. Let's open a fresh document and see how this works for us. Here we have a document that has a white background layer with an ordinary green layer above it. Now we can create 3D objects in Photoshop in a variety of ways, but for this demo, we'll keep it simple. First of all, I have the Move tool active. This is one of the most important tools in working with 3D, as we'll see. We'll make sure the green layer is selected in the Layers panel, and we'll choose 3D, New Mesh from Layer, Mesh Preset, Cube. At this point, Photoshop will ask if you'd like to switch to the 3D workspace, and I recommend yes, because the panels that you need to work with 3D will be front and center in that workspace and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Now a number of things have happened. Our view changes, the interface changes, and your first thought might be, oh no, what have I done here? Not to worry. We'll take a look through all of this and we'll explain as we go. First of all, notice the tool options for the Move tool. Here we now have several 3D options available, with the first one being rotate the 3D object, which is the default. With the Move tool still active, these different modes are how we control the 3D objects and the 3D views. If we click here in the drawing, away from the object, we can drag to rotate the entire scene. Notice that we really do have a 3D cube, and the front face is green, the color of the layer that we started with. As we move around, Notice the grid. This represents what we call the ground plane, and it is important for several reasons. First of all, it gives us a visual reference to help us orient ourselves and align objects. And second, the ground plane acts as a virtual surface to catch shadows or to create reflections. Notice that this object has a shadow by default. The grid fades off into the distance, giving us a sense of perspective and again helping to keep us oriented. Notice also that the grid has red and blue lines that correspond to the X and the Z axis as we see in the axis widget down here in the corner. Again, this helps keep us oriented as we move things around in the document. 
Now notice also this secondary view up in the corner. This is currently showing the top view, which we can see here. But we can switch between any number of predefined views here. In fact, we can click this icon here in the corner to swap the views between the primary and the secondary view. Now we see the top view in our main view and our oblique view is now in the secondary view. This is a really nice feature that can help our workflow. Now if we don't want to see the secondary display, we can click this X to close the view. and We can turn it back on by going into the view menu under show and selecting secondary view. We'll go ahead and leave this off for now. Now about this shadow. It falls on the ground plane as I mentioned a moment ago, but we can change it by interacting with the light itself right here on the screen. Notice the infinite light number one that is indicated by this white icon. If we click the light to select it, the move tool now affects the light and the widget here in the center gives a better idea of the angle and direction of our infinite light. It's easiest to grab the widget right here by this handle and we can move the light and drag around to reposition it and we can see the shadow updating dynamically as we do so. Notice also that the light is having an effect on how our 3D cube is being lit up as well. Controlling the lights is a key part of creating realistic 3D scenes and we'll cover this in much more detail in a later tutorial. If we select the cube, we can interact with it directly by using this axis widget in the center. Each axis has a set of controls that allow movement, scaling, and rotation for that axis only. As we hover over these controls, they highlight in yellow to indicate that they're active. So for example, we can drag right here to rotate the cube in this manner. I'll hit undo. If we drag on any one of these arrows, we can move in that direction and we can control and constrain our movement to one single axis at a time. Likewise, the scaling allows us to scale in one direction. We can scale up and we can scale down. If we grab the center, we have a large yellow block and this allows us to scale the entire object all at once. Again, I'm going to undo that and get back to our original cube. Now it's important to be careful where you're clicking as you're trying to interact with this widget because with this cube, if we actually click on the face, notice how the axis widget and the selection box changes. In this case, we're now controlling just that face and if we drag, we can see we're just moving the one face of the object. We'll undo that. Before we move on, notice here in the 3D panel how the front face is selected. And this is what allows us to control it independently of the rest of the object. We can click Cube in the 3D panel to make sure the entire cube is selected so that we're moving it. Speaking of the 3D panel, it's really important to understand how this panel works. In fact, the Properties panel right above it is equally critical in working with 3D and Photoshop, so much so that you may want to pull them out and position them side by side in your working area, and you can dock them together so that they can move as a unit. You can then keep other panels active in the sidebar here, and you can save this as a custom workspace by clicking here and choosing New Workspace. Now here I've already got mine set up and I'll choose Mike 3 d and you can see my 3D and Properties panels here side by side floating and docked together with all of my other common panels that I use here in the sidebar. Now having the 3D and the Properties panel together is important because as we select different elements of the scene in the 3D panel, the Properties panel changes to show the options and settings that we can change for each individual element. So for clicking on a mesh like the cube, we see only coordinates. And if we choose the environment, 
we see properties controlling things like the global ambient light, the ground plane shadows and reflections. Or if we click on the materials for one of the faces, we see an entirely different set of properties related to the appearance of the material. For example, here's where we might change the material on the front face from this green solid to, let's say, bricks. And finally, if we click on the infinite light itself, we have an adjustment that we can use to, for example, soften the shadow of the infinite light. And you can see it's softened it up quite a bit here with 40% softness. Again, we're going to explore all of these properties in great detail over the next few tutorials. Now, a few final hints. We can select the scene to go back to the view where the move tool will affect the scene itself. Make sure that you click once away from the objects to help prevent moving the objects and make sure that you're just moving the scene. This prevents the objects from becoming misaligned. As we saw earlier with the secondary view, the 3D extras are all here in the view menu under show. And since they're considered to be Photoshop extras, we can show and hide them in the same way that we control other extras in Photoshop by using Control H or Command H to hide or show them as a toggle. With the extras hidden, we can see our 3D scene composited on the background, which is a 2D layer. Now there's one step that you can do at the end after you've created your 3D object, and that is to render the view. As we're working with it, Photoshop is doing a fairly good job of showing the objects as they should look. But when we start getting multiple lights, multiple materials and reflections, Photoshop can't really keep up with it in real time. So we can render this view by clicking the icon right here in the Properties panel. We can also choose Render from the 3D menu or simply Press Control Alt Shift R or Command Option Shift R. Photoshop begins calculating the scene, and this could take anywhere from minutes to hours or even longer, depending on the complexity of the scene and the speed of your GPU. You'll see the progress displayed in the status bar here. And you may notice some wacky things going on with the time, counting down and counting up. But at a minimum, you can keep track of the progress by percentage and know how far into the render you are at any given point in time. You can interrupt the render by pressing escape at any time or by clicking away. And then you can resume the render simply by clicking on this icon or again pressing command option shift R or control alt shift R on a PC. Once the render is complete, we can see the difference in the quality of the shadows, much more realistic and subtle. Again, light reflections and shadows will really show up with full accuracy only after a final render. And if you move something or change a property, you'll have to re-render. So perform a full render near the end of your project. At this point, you've got the basic tools you need to understand Photoshop's 3D environment. In the next tutorial, we'll look at various ways of creating 3D objects. And as we work through this series of videos, I'm confident you'll develop a solid understanding of the ways these tools can be used individually and together to create some great 3D compositions in Photoshop CS6. My name is Mike Hoffman. My website is hoffmanartdesign.com. You'll find a variety of photography, Photoshop, and Lightroom tutorials and related information there. Or you can follow me at mhoffman2001 on Twitter, and you can find me on Google Plus by simply going to gplusmikehoffman.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this tutorial.